Welcome to Voices in Leadership, live streamed worldwide from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I'm Dean Michelle Williams. The goal of Voices is to highlight the experiences of leaders confronting major public health frontiers and to better understand effective leadership and how it can affect change. I hope you find this program engaging and informative. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to our audience here in the studio and to our viewers online around the globe. I'm Eric Anderson, the Director of Voices in Leadership. This series focuses on the lessons of effective leadership to create positive change in public health. This event takes place in the Leadership Studio where the programs and related content have received over four million views to date and counting. <coughs> Today, we host a discussion entitled, Leadership Begins in the Community, Peace Corps and Global Health with Professor Richard Frank and Dr. Jody Olson. Dr. Jody Olson was sworn into office as the 20th Director of the Peace Corps in March 2018. She is committed to leading a Peace Corps that remains the world's preeminent volunteer agency, offering all Americans the opportunity to serve their country. Under her leadership, volunteers' health, safety, and security will remain the agency's top priorities. Dr. Olson began her career as a Peace Corps volunteer, serving in Tunisia from 1966 to 1968. She has since served the agency in multiple leadership positions. Prior to returning to the Peace Corps in 2018, Dr. Olson served as a visiting professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore, School of Social Work, and director of the University Center for Global Education Initiatives. Throughout her career, Dr. Olson has championed the expansion of service, learning, and international opportuni opportunities for Americans of all backgrounds. Before I turn this discussion over to our moderator, Professor Richard Frank, a Peace Corps volunteer in Botswana in 1975 and 1976, please join me as we welcome Dr. Jody Olson to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Thank you. Dr. Olson, uh, welcome to Boston and the Chan School of Public Health. Uh, it's a special pleasure for me to, uh, uh, to be interviewing you as a uh, returned Peace Corps volunteer myself and the father of a recently returned Peace Corps volunteer. And so I'm thrilled to get a chance to visit with you. Um, Thank you. It's, it's, I'm very excited to be here. Shall we uh, dive right in? Yes, let's go. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, as Eric mentioned, you've been a volunteer, a country director, a regional director, chief of staff, and now director of Peace Corps. It's clear that there is probably no one on earth who knows the agency better than you. Uh, what experiences coming up through the ranks and beyond have most affected the way you lead? Well, I appreciate the question uh, because I've been in and out of Peace Corps several times, as you see. And what I have found exciting is that beginning in the community, in Tunisia, Seuss, Tunisia, when you have to live and breathe it the way every Peace Corps volunteer lives and breathes it, and all the vulnerabilities that go with it, struggling to learn Arabic, really struggling to learn Arabic, struggling <laughs> to learn French, and how that carries with you in every other role that you play. What I feel excited about, too, with Peace Corps, because it has a five-year rule, and so when you work for Peace Corps for five years, you have to turn in your badge, say goodbye, everybody celebrates you, and you go off. And I have had opportunities to work in academia and in nonprofits, in global development, and so then when I have come back to Peace Corps, I bring a new set of skills, and in particular, having been able to work in academia in a couple of times when I was not at Peace Corps, I now am very excited about university connections with Peace Corps, the recruitment side of Peace Corps, appreciating what faculty give to uh, students and help prepare them for Peace Corps. So I feel very lucky in having this leadership role, but knowing and never forgetting the roots of being a Peace Corps volunteer. That's where it begins. That's great. Uh, uh, since probably it's been a, uh, just a, a little bit, as you say, there's a five-year rule, um, how do you keep in touch with sort of the modern demands on the volunteer and, and the sort of changed environment that they all serve in? Well, today, as we know, that there's instant communication and so the programs that we have, because it is about integrating into the community, it is about language, it is about 
eating fufu in Togo with your family, about chasing the chickens, taking the kids to market, and none of that involves a cell phone. So part of what we do today is suggest to volunteers there's a time to connect with the family, but there's a bigger time to really be present in the day-to-day -day activity of what you're doing and being in that community. And what's exciting today is that as the volunteer communicates home, usually about once a week, that family at home is now being part of the Peace Corps experience. And so I feel that today's way of being a Peace Corps volunteer mm -hmm. is actually broadening the role that volunteers play and better bringing together the communities, the counterparts, the students with people in the United States. I might note that one other aspect that we're continuing to discover is that volunteers who return home often stay in touch. And so they might for the next three to five years continue to be mentoring their students and then flying back five years later to go to the graduation. Mm -hmm. Or they might be continuing to give advice and taking advice from counterparts. So what used to be a two-year experience is now integrated into a lifetime of experience. Yeah, very true. Um, certainly true of my son. Uh, what, are, um, what methods do you use to communicate now that you're distant? I guess the technology has made it easier, but what are the techniques that you use to stay in touch with volunteers, with country staff, et cetera? The, Part of the, what you always have to think about or what I always have to think about is not over communicating because I could technically send an email out to the world once a day, but uh, that doesn't work right. necessarily <laughs> after the third day, <laughs> delete. <laughs> so the important part is all the ways. So what we do, for example, is you know have on our website a lot of materials for staff and for volunteers overseas. How do we make those very user friendly that volunteers can climb into them easily? And shape those to make them, we call them lib guides, and they have all kinds of projects and trainings and things that volunteers connect with. We also have uh, informal talking by phone between headquarters and the country posts. Uh, I send out a monthly newsletter to tell everybody that we're really appreciative of what they're doing and the events that are going on. We uh, do we, uh, text message, we have Facebooks uh, pieces. You can tell I'm not very comfortable with these words, <laughs> <laughs> the social media words. And it's important that we find a lot of different avenues for communication because, as you all know, by generation, we communicate in different ways, that the younger we are, we're more likely to communicate through very specific social media ways. Older folks de generate, we're still on Facebook, and actually put a stamp on an envelope once in a while. So uh, it's understanding how to mix and match all those ways of communicating effectively. That's great. Um, you know, one of the things that I think we share as volunteers is that when you become a volunteer, you're sort of giving yourself over. Yes. And you really don't know what you're getting into mm -hmm. at the time. And so uh, probably more than almost any other organization, you rely on trust. Yep. And uh, not, But in your job, you have to build that trust, but then you also have a zillion other constituencies. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the way you work on building trust from the various corners? Trust is key. And coming back very quickly to being a Peace Corps volunteer is where trust has to be established and every one of us has to learn about trust. And because you can't be effective with your community, your counterpart, with your students, if you don't have open trust, if you don't share your own vulnerabilities. And that's a lesson, I think, as you alluded to, Professor, that you have to take in various leadership roles that you have later on in how do I be transparent as I can? How do I be as honest as I can? How do I put it out there as much as I can, whether it's internal, whether it's external? Because of today's way of communicating, instant it can be, that you have to be who you are. You have to be straightforward. 
you have to communicate as directly as you can because it comes back. And so I really work hard to be as honest and straightforward as I can in however I communicate. And I learned that again uh, in a community when I was a volunteer. And um, how do you balance the demands? Uh, you know, you have to navigate the State Department, yeah. uh, the embassies, uh, other NGOs that are operating alongside you. How do you sort of navigate that while at the same time holding that trust of the volunteer? The you know, navigating with all the other federal agencies, nonprofits, groups, posts, the global community that we work with. Fortunately, we have a team. We have a wonderful staff team. And the important part for me is that within that staff team, we understand what our message is. We understand uh, what we're saying about the importance of the community experience, about the importance of the volunteer, and the importance of being in countries as they invite us to be there. So whether it's me with the Department of State or whether it is with somebody else, it's really through the team, but it is a consistent message flowing outward. And so the team building in the senior staff is key because of having global communications. You're all needing to carry those same kinds of messages, including the country director, who's informally close to the ambassadors in every one of these countries. And I always have to remember that when I'm sharing an idea, that idea is going to keep rippling. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you want to say, ooh, I want that one back. <laughs> it went a little bit farther than I wanted. But the importance of, be, of knowing this is what's going to happen and that you're sharing a common theme so that it can ripple out throughout the world as we meet with the various constituents. So, you know, as a volunteer, you're often taught that you should be bringing people along to take over your job. Right. And, you know, I guess what you just said makes me think that a lot, to some extent you're doing the same thing mm -hmm. in leadership at Peace Corps. So uh, can you talk about your mentoring oh, yeah. style a little bit in, in the context of your leadership team? Uh, mentoring is very, very important because I, I think as a leader, it's really important to know that you have been given this opportunity and you're not going to have it very long. I mean, you hope you get it a fairly long period of time, but you're only in it for a certain period of time. And how do you mentor others? How do you make it possible for the next generation or the people that come after, after you? And for me, it's trying to share what goes through my head. It's trying to share what about this, what about that? so that others are hearing some of the thinking as it's being thought. The other part of it for me is to say, when someone says, mm, not a great idea, that you're hearing it and you're talking about it. But it's, those are the formal and the informal ways of sharing who you are. Others can like it or not like it, but at least they understand what, is, what your particular leadership about, is about. I also think it's really important, particularly uh, with people who otherwise don't have immediate access to mentors, to mentor particularly younger people. And so we have people, for example, that work <coughs> at Peace Corps that are returning Peace Corps volunteers. And so they might be 26 and they've been at Peace Corps for a year. An opportunity to sit with them, talk with them, hear what they have to say. They teach me a lot and I want to be there for them in terms of how I think. And I, I find that a really important responsibility is to mentor, mentor, mentor. And part of that is just sharing yourself with all the warts that go with it. Yeah, it, it's um, interesting that you started your answer off by, in a sense, raising up the sense of urgency you feel mm -hmm. in terms of the press of time. I guess there's a double whammy for uh, somebody in your position in that there's the natural flow of Peace Corps, and then you're a political appointee above that. Yes. And does that really heighten that sort of well, there's a, thinking of the clock? Yes, there's always thinking of the clock. Well, and Peace Corps is about thinking of the clock. 
without thinking of the clock, but when you're a Peace Corps volunteer, you have two years. And I know for some of you who have been Peace Corps volunteers, you get to about month 19, it's like, oh my heavens, I'm gonna be leaving. I gotta make every moment count. You become very conscious of the clock. When you're a Peace Corps staff person, five years, and in my previous times with Peace Corps, very conscious of the clock, in the way of I'm learning a lot, I'm leading in one particular area, I have to give away this information. If I take this information with me at the end of five years, it doesn't do anybody any good. So it gives a chance to continue to keep that flow outward of sharing information. And so as a political appointee, you know, again, I have a temporary time leading the Peace Corps, but in Peace Corps' case, it's not a lot different from everybody else. And what it has taught me, and I think it's important for everyone, no matter how long they're in a position, is share knowledge, share information, share back out, share it. Because it doesn't do any good just sitting in your head. And I, and being present with others, with your ideas, to me is key to being an effective leader. That's great. Um, let me talk about a little bit about uh, sort of the idea of how much of this is taught or can be learned in a sort of formal way and how much of it is uh, learning by doing, succeeding, and failing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of doing, succeeding, and failing. <laughs> and the learning is with the failing. Um, again, I go back to Peace Corps because, uh, and it was right what you said in the beginning, when you become a Peace Corps volunteer, you give yourself away. Uh, you're, you're not you. I, I mean, you're just trying to learn everything else. And in giving yourself away, something happens. You discover yourself and you understand who you are. And you learn better how to measure yourself against others in the sense of how am I listening to the other person? How am I observing what's happening around me? How do I take that in and feed that back effectively that others can hear me? And so to me is a core element to begin a leadership journey is to have a self-understanding uh, of who you are and how you relate to other people. Everything else can be learned, I think, and partly with failing. But when you have that self-understanding, the failure says, aha, let me look at myself. What didn't quite work out because of something I didn't quite do? That is what moves one forward into these positions. And so anyone who wants leadership positions, they're important, they're good, and any role that we play has leadership characteristics to it. But always think about how could I have done that better? How do I think about that in the context of others? Uh, that's the key to me to, to begin the leadership journey. That's interesting that you uh, sort of really focused on this idea of you need to learn about yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, the question, so can you give us uh, like some examples of the things that you've had to learn about yourself that have most contributed to uh, you think you're improving as a leader? Um, I was very shy <laughs> and a very strong introvert. People laugh when I say that now. Back in the day. <laughs> yeah, back in the day. <laughs> there I was, very quiet. Uh, I had to learn about myself to say something, to have a voice, to trust an idea. And part of trusting the idea is in listening to what's going on in your head with your idea as other people are talking and thinking, okay, let me put it out there. But let me put it out there, not that it's a done idea or that it's going to be the greatest idea given, that it's just something that's going to move on to a con in a conversation. And that was very hard for me to do and part of the learning. Let me give one very quick example. When I began as a Peace Corps volunteer in Tunisia, I walked into a post office and I saw you know, the men were wearing the burnouses down to their feet and the women were covered and there was a lot of noise and everybody was speaking Arabic and I didn't know Arabic at the time and it looked like a lot of confusion. And I wanted to buy a stamp and mail a letter. And I remember standing at the door saying, there's no way I can do this. This, this, this is over for me. I'd only been there a week. 
So I stood at the door, and I'll never forget it. I just watched, 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 watched. What does this look like? What is it? I'm never going to, I'm not going to understand right now what they're saying, but let me just start seeing if I can find patterns. I sat, I stood there for 10 minutes, and at the end of the 10 minutes, I went, ah, oh, okay, I get how this is done. And I had the confidence to then be able to step forward and even mumble, mumble something. That's where I began to learn that about myself. Take the time to observe, to listen, to be present with the situation, and it will give you the courage to then speak. Yeah, so you've sort of emphasized that as a leader, a lot of what you do is put yourself out there in a kind of clear and honest way. How do you balance that with you don't want to do that too much. No. <laughs> and so, so the question is, so the, how do you balance that with like self-control? What, what does that balance look like? I think the balance comes in, uh, you know, even as you're having meetings and senior meetings of some type, that how do I think about maybe I'll talk for five minutes and I have my little list here of things. How do I make sure I hear? and that other people are going to be talking. And I mean, I could fill up all the space, but I have to consciously say, it's important that I consciously say, I'm not going to fill up all the space. I'm going to fill up a little teeny piece of the space. What are the three and four most important things for me to say? And create a comfort level for other leaders in the agency to speak up and talk and talk to each other. So I have a, I try to have a filter on, the amount of time I'll use, and to be efficient about that, and then just let it go, and let it create that environment for others to pick up in whatever ways they want to pick up. So it's like the opposite of a filibuster. Yeah, the opposite of a filibuster. <laughs> oh my heavens, oh yeah. yeah. I wouldn't even know how to go about that. <laughs> um, let me now turn to, um, so the Peace Corps has had, well, as it, in its natural course, has its share of crises. Mm -hmm. And how have you prepared yourself? Because you've known this probably from the beginning. How yeah. have you prepared yourself to deal with, the, get ready for the next one? Oh, yes. <laughs> Peace Corps has crises. Um, one of the things I learned about myself, and I think it was during my time in Tunisia, is I tend to get calm in a crisis. And I don't know what it is, but I, I tend to get calm. And so I feel very lucky. But when you think about crises, the most important part of a crisis is to prevent one <laughs> and to have all your points in place that you've got checklists, you've rehearsed. Uh, I mean, we rehearse, for example, a coup in a country. I mean, we don't go through the coup, but we uh, think about what would we do if there was a coup in a country? What happens with the Peace Corps volunteers? So we go through and talk through what does that look like? What are the options? Write down the procedures, because this could be, you know, so far away the whole system could go down. And we've got to make sure that those in the country are also prepared. So we are very strong on procedures. And I've learned in managing crises, the most important part is procedures and prevention to the extent, now you can't prevent everything, but that you have discipline and you've practiced. When, you, when the crisis occurs, because yes, there will be a coup in a country somewhere, <laughs> that you have ready to go people who have various roles with this crisis. And in today's world, because of instant communication, you're thinking of the country, you're thinking of the volunteers, you're also thinking of the parents, you're thinking of Capitol Hill, you're thinking of the world, you're thinking of the news feeds, and everybody has a perspective on this crisis. And the perspective on this crisis is not necessarily the accurate one, um, or they have variations of accuracy. So. You take your procedures, your checklist, you're there and everybody knows what their role is. And part of that is identifying how you communicate. The communication, I think, in a crisis is key, 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 and all the variations of that communication. 
the next part of the crisis is the safety and security of the Peace Corps volunteers. And we have procedures set up for how to move them around very quickly and get them to where they need to be and not need to be. And then after that, you're looking at what did we learn from this? What are the longer next steps? But it is throughout it all in the preparation, the checklist, the review, the happening, getting that first team together, the check-ins, whether it's hourly or daily as you're moving forward, is I feel on my part, the most important thing is asking questions, staying calm, thanking people, uh, bringing people in, being very appreciative of what people are doing because often people in a crisis will work 24 seven. They will go way out of their way. They will do things they didn't need to do and to recognize that even as it is happening will keep as much calmness as possible when, as I say, a coup and you have to move volunteers in 12 hours or 24 hours even out of the country and you don't have enough spots on the plane and you get the picture. That it is that preparation and that constant respect for people who are managing all the details of that crisis. And so, um in sort of reviewing, having been through a few of those, I yeah. imagine, yes. um, what is the most important thing to keep in mind f that you've learned? Uh, for example, what mistakes are most common and what do you sort of keep in mind when you're in the thick of it? Okay, when I'm in the thick of it or when any of us are in the thick of it, thick of it the, the crisis piece is, I gotta do something. And you're thinking about Oh my heavens, the Andes are falling down. I remember when we saw the earthquake in Peru several years ago and CNN was immediately reporting what looked like the Andes falling down. Well, they weren't quite falling down, but it was pretty serious. And so the immediate reaction is, I have to do something, I have to do something. I have to get the volunteers out. I have to move this, I have to do that. I have to call the parents, I have to. And so it is so critical in that crisis is to count to 10 look at the to-do list and have that process right there in front of you, keeping your voice calm because your instinct is to do just the opposite. No matter which role you're playing, you're, you're wanting to just reach out for something and it's not necessarily the right thing. And I've talked to country directors, for example, when we've had a very ser serious situation with a Peace Corps volunteer, and all of a sudden you know that the situation is pretty serious. I remember a volunteer, tell I mean a Peace Corps director telling me in country, I took out my checklist. At that very second, I took out my checklist. And then I knew exactly what needed to happen, how it could happen, and how I could continue that leadership role as it happened, because I was able to take my emotion out of it for that time. My emotions can come in later, but for now, I need to stay calm, I need to lead, I need to follow the plan. So this is a, uh, a great way to sort of, uh, uh, sort of get to the end on, because perhaps that's an incredibly important message for the public health and the health policy yeah. world, which yeah. is stay with the discipline, use mm -hmm. the checklist, mm -hmm. Uh, keep it under wraps and under control. Um, so thank you very much. Well, it has you. been a thrill for me to be here, and um, I think the audience, uh, no doubt uh, from the faces I see, agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to everyone. I, I feel very grateful to be here.